uh, to none other than Sharon Jones. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so happy that I have this opportunity, an opportunity to speak forth, you know, from a spiritual perspective, from a health and wellness perspective, and just from a perspective of being able to have harmony and balance and alignment in our lives. And so tonight, uh, the topic is building personal resiliency and adaptability. Um, everyone needs uh, to have that personal resilience. Uh, it's kind of like being like water. Uh, there are so many things that can come at you. And so if you're like water, water seems to find its way around the rocks. It, it, it finds its way. And so, uh, matter of fact, it finds its way when there is no way. And so oftentimes we will find ourselves at any given time at a point in our life when we feel like there's no way or we're not gonna make it out or, uh, and so that's when personal resiliency and adaptability come into play. Enough about me. And so how do we nourish our spirit when it seems like everything around us is going wrong, when it seems as though when we try to do the right thing, it turns out to be the wrong thing. And so, we have to have uh, things prior in our life that's gonna nourish our spirit. Now we know that there are some positive things that can nourish our spirit and that's really what I'm speaking to because some people may feel like some negative things can nourish the spirit as well. No judgment, but uh, when we talk about nourishing the spirit, we're talking about positive things that are gonna align us with spirit. Really, uh, when we talk about nourishing the spirit, we're talking about self-care of the spirit. Uh, just like we nurture our bodies for good physical health, uh, we wanna nurture, nurture the spirit. And that's not just on the outside, but from the inside out, from our core. And so uh, tonight I'm touching on spiritual health. Uh, we know that mind, body, spirit, and also community play a huge role in, in our lives. And so we're talking about spiritual health. Uh, a, a huge part of spiritual health is compassion. Compassion for self, compassion for others, having that compassion. Also having the capacity to love, you know, uh, you know to have a heart that's driven by love. And another one, which is kind of tough for a lot of people is forgiveness. You know, oftentimes something can happen or we may feel like someone has done us wrong and we cannot move uh, uh, beyond unforgiveness. But all three are essential for spiritual health. Compassion, our, our capacity for forgiveness, and also being able to have joy in your life. And you may say, I can't have joy because something terrible has happened to me or my family or things are not lining up the way that I want. But joy is a wonderful catalyst. And also striving for fulfillment in life. So we're talking about spiritual health. Uh, we're talking about having compassion for ourselves and others. We're talking about forgiving others and forgiving ourselves. And we're talking about fulfillment and joy. Now, oftentimes we can really clean up on the outside. We can wear all the fancy hairstyles. We can wear all the fancy clothes, cologne and everything. But at this moment, I'm speaking to the non-physical part of ourselves. Some people refer to it as that small, still voice that we often hear and oftentimes don't listen to. That small, still voice drives our emotions. It drives our feelings. And it starts to construct our character in a different way if we do not listen to that small, still voice. So I'm talking about the spirit, the non-physical part of ourselves. Another important thing about spirit is that it gives life. If you have a crushed spirit or a broken spirit, oftentimes you'll notice that a part of your well-being may start to 
crumble, such as your physical health or maybe even your mental health. And so nourishing that spirit, because the spirit is vital, it gives life, it, it renews. We're talking about supernatural, meaning that we have a divine blueprint that's already been shaped, a divine blueprint that tells us who we really are. And oftentimes it is put on the back burner because uh, we really believe that our experiences are who we are, but we already have a blueprint. We just need to align with it and operate from it. And so again, we're talking about spirit, uh, the non-physical part of ourselves, the small still voice. Uh, some refer to it as intuition, uh, the Holy Spirit. And so God, who is so gracious and is all-knowing and um, he's the, the creator, you know, he sees the, the full picture when we can't see it. And he sends out his spirit. He's so generous that he sends out his spirit or his energy uh, to accomplish his, his will. And so, of course, in the Bible, uh, there are many Bible translations, but in the Hebrew, there are words that speak about the spirit of God and God's active force. Some people refer to it as our life force. Um, some people refer to it as my light is going out. I don't feel the same like I used to. And then we know that the Holy Spirit uh, is, a, is a leader in our lives. So there are so many things that are going on currently uh, in, in the world, maybe in our lives, in our families. And it's, it's not unusually uh, where we may get out of alignment. Uh, some of those things may be extreme sorrow or the loss of a loved one, uh, which also leads to grief. Feelings are rejected. No one likes to be rejected. And so that can also get us out of alignment. Also betrayal. Betrayal. You may feel like the person was your best friend, your best partner, and all of a sudden betrayal enters the story. Oftentimes we feel that we are missing the mark. We could have a PhD, two PhDs. We could have a successful business. We could have all types of people that loves us, but within our spirit, we feel we're missing the mark. And so all of that can lead us out of alignment, alignment with our true uh, divine blueprint. Uh, also, Three words, not good enough. Many people feel that they're not good enough. I'm not sure where the origination came, but someone must have spoken the words or some kind of way the feeling must have been picked up. And so not good enough can lead to a lot of problems and situations. Also, being treated unfair uh, can get us out of alignment. I'm, I see many of the uh, the protests, or if you want to say it, people are, are, are speaking out because they feel that things are unfair. All of that can get us out of alignment. And of course, it can lead to anger. There are many people who are angry. Uh, they, are, they are living with depression. And there's so much fear that's going around and all of that gets us out of alignment. So there's, the, the key is to stay in alignment, uh, to know who you truly are, and to know that you're good enough, and to know that uh, in time you will accomplish what you need to accomplish. Other things that get us out of alignment are what we call adverse experiences, such as physical abuse. Many people are enduring physical abuse. They're also uh, dealing with emotional abuse. Uh, an example of emotional abuse is you can feel that you're doing everything you're doing to try to make things work, and then that person pretty much tells you you're not doing enough, that you'll never be anyone. And then what really makes it bad is when, the, when it goes, it, it's repeated and it's passed down generationally as well. Sexual abuse, all of these are adverse experiences that get us out of alignment. Physical neglect which can come about from being depressed or having a lot of anxiety, 
uh, where you may not feel like getting up, uh, grooming yourself, or you may not even feel like um, leaving the house and emotional neglect, where you isolate yourself, you're not around people, you don't really want to be bothered with people. And then, of course, we know about domestic violence, where, you know, there's that the whole fight or flight mode where you, you feel threatened, and then all of a sudden, the honeymoon phase comes in, and things are okay, and then it escalates again. And so, you can be repeatedly out of alignment other things that uh, lead to uh, being out of alignment, spiritually out of alignment, uh, parental substance use, or if you're living with a parent or a family member that's living with mental illness. Also parental separation and divorce. And of course, whenever there's a suicide or someone passes away, we, everyone uh, gets out of alignment. And other things to deal with are crime or if a family member is in prison or incarcerated, all of these things get not only the person out of alignment, but the whole family structure, a unit, and the extended family. So these are all adverse types of things that we have to deal with. And so how do you deal with it is the question. You have to have personal resiliency, and you also have to be able to adapt to change. Uh, many people say it's not the strongest of the species the strongest of the species that survive, but the ones who are able to adapt to change. Also, when we look at trauma, just to go back to trauma, trauma is about experiencing something that is so deeply distressful uh, that you are continuously disturbed by it. So again, you're out of alignment, you're out of harmony. So when we talk about inner distress, and at any given time, no one is exempt, you may receive inner distress. If your boss calls you in for your performance evaluation, distress might brew up. <laughs> or if you feel like uh, there, there's going to be a reduction in force on the job, inner distress. Um, community violence, not being able to walk to the mailbox or not being able to be out after a certain time can all lead to inner distress. And so... When the spirit is broken, it prevents the person from being able to receive the comfort that they need for this distress. Also, early in life is important as well for our, for our young children. Uh, the brain starts to develop for young children and they start to set their blueprint early in life, like between age three, zero and three. So if developmental things are trauma like we just spoke about happens, that can really place the individual or the child at risk for physical health concerns, mental health concerns, and even not even being feeling comfortable in social uh, situations or in the community. And this is a quote by Dr. Bruce Perry that has done a lot of work on trauma, uh, I think in the state of Texas and throughout the world. Also, Oprah Winfrey, have to quote Oprah, when she learned about adverse experiences, because she uh, revealed that she had uh, experienced an adverse uh, experience, which is sexual abuse, she quoted, unless you fix the trauma, which is like a hole in your soul, uh, where, where, the wound start, where the wound started, you are working on the wrong thing. So again, you have to go back to your core. You have to go back to working from the inside out. Again, we can really uh, beauty up the outside so wonderful. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, many people are gifted and talented. But you can be walking beautiful on the outside and have a hole in your soul. So it's about that spiritual alignment. Also, spiritual progress. We, we often talk about progress in terms of our goals that we are accomplishing on the job or in the business world. But... Not very many people that I've met set spiritual goals. Um, and so spiritual progress is like a detoxing or a detoxification. Things have to come up and be released in order for healing to occur. The same for therapy. Once you enter into therapy and you start talking about all the things you haven't talked about for years, the pain, the suffering, the distress, all of a sudden, uh, Things seem a little bit worse, kind of almost like the 
the storm before the calm. <laughs> and so then uh, after you talk about it and it starts to release and come up out of you, then the healing can take place. So we're talking about setting goals for spiritual progress. Another thing, um, oftentimes when situations happen to us, and they, they happen to all of us, they happen to therapists, uh, no one is exempt. We have a tendency of hitting the replay button over and over and over again. It may be about unfairness. It may be about justice. It may be about the loss of a loved one. It may be about the loss of a job. It, and so we have a tendency just to repeat it over and over and to replay it over and over. And so this is just a little quote that says, let it go. You know, what if this happens? What if that happened? I would, but what if this happened? And so oftentimes we never move forward because the what ifs have just taken us down. And so we must let it go. Again, release. If it's unforgiveness, release. Let it go. So when we are dealing with the what ifs, because they come up all the time, and they, they really do hinder us from even moving forward. So one thing about dealing with what ifs, uh, you want to really take note of those and, and choose a peaceful peaceful atmosphere where you're not disturbed and start to write down your thoughts. You know, why do you have so much anxiety? Why are you feeling so disturbed in your spirit and, and in your core? And write it down so you can start to gain, a, gain an awareness about it. And take note of your thoughts. Uh, many people have learned when you change the way you look at things, things change. And what you think about all day, you become. And so those are some of the thoughts behind that. So what are the consequences of the thoughts that you're having? And of course, work to release. There's nothing greater than release. Even when the tea kettle is on the stove and it, it starts to release, you hear this beautiful whistle. So there's power in releasing. But after you release, also adapt and get some new messages. Messages that are going to help you. Messages that are going to make you feel like you are enough. And, and messages uh, that really, really cause your life energy or your life force or your spirit to really flourish. So get rid of the what ifs and start to develop new messages for yourself. Watch the thoughts that you're thinking all day long because that's what you become. And also watch your words because words are creators. Words uh, can empower, but they also can deflate. And so when you're having the what ifs, that's what it does. It, it gets you to a place where you're stuck and where you don't feel like doing anything. The power of resiliency. The power of when you fall down, you get up. I think Donnie McClurkin said, we fall down, but we get up. And it's been said in many ways, but what they're speaking about is resiliency. Uh, the capacity to recover. And I'm sure so many people have gone through so many things and they're going through it daily. But the key is not how you fall down, but how you get back up and how you recover and how you empower others through your testimony because there's strength in speaking words and speaking testimonies and sharing stories. So the power of resiliency, reflecting on how you've been resilient in your life and how you've bounce back or how you, you know, the great comeback. Another thing is that sometimes it's not that easy. So when we are building emotional resiliency uh, and, and we're building emotional resiliency to keep us in alignment. Sometimes when, we, when we're out of alignment, we get off the path of recovery. We get off the path of doing great things. And so we have to focus on so at that time, the things that we really can improve, we have to come up with solutions for ourselves. And sometimes when people cannot come up with solutions for themselves, that's why they go to a therapist or they go to, to a mentor or a coach, someone who can almost like with the thing about footprints, you know, the person saw the footprints in the sand and then God was carrying that person. 
you know, because there was only one foot of uh, one set of footprints. And so that's kind of how it is. Sometimes when you can't do it, you can't see your way through. Someone else may be able to help you. So, of course, this requires flexibility. And many of us are rigid. Many of us uh, are opposed to change. It's hard. And, and being open-minded. Mind, it doesn't mean you agree with the other person. You might not. When they're talking, it might sound like a different language. But just being a listening ear and being non-judgmental and hearing them out builds resilience. Perceptions. We all have perceptions. We all have a worldview. One person might look at your shirt and say, oh, it's powder blue. Another person may look at your shirt and say, it's royal blue. So we all have different lenses. And again, from age zero to three, that map and how we see the world was developing. And so it shapes our perceptions, how we see people, what we think of people, you know, uh, what we, uh, how we view the world, how we see events. Um, and so everyone has a worldview that we have to be mindful of because that's a part of emotional resilience as well. Hostility doesn't do us any good. Again, we have to be solution focused. We have to move away from unforgiveness. We have to ad adapt more joy in our lives and more fulfillment and stay on a path of recovery so that we can stay in alignment. So again, Forgiveness, negativity. Boy, negativity can be very destructive. You might notice even on Facebook, you can put a wonderful quote out on Facebook, you may not even get a like. But if you put out there a, a video of someone fighting or a shootout or something, oh my goodness, they go to hitting it up and everything like that. So again, uh, having more of a positive uh, uh, aspect uh, not harboring destructive things toward others because really what you harbor toward others, you're, you're pulling, you're drawn to yourself. And so resentment again can lead not only to mental health concerns, but physical health and also isolation in the community and away from others. So, well, I can't say enough about forgiveness. It's, it's, a, it's a game changer. It's hard to do, but we have to get on that pathway of forgiveness uh, as well. So some of the things that build emotional resilience are being generous, having a giving spirit, and trying to stay away from the negativity. Although sometimes we may go a little negative, but to catch it real quick and let's bounce back. Striving for goodness, goodness for everyone, and not perfection, because I don't think anyone is really perfect. You can think that you, you're perfect and all of a sudden someone will come up and say, oh, that's a horrible dress you have on. So I don't think any of us can really uh, be perfect. There's only one person that's perfect and he's the origi originator, the creator, and the maker. Boy, the next one, give up the need to be right. It's hard to release it because we all want to be right. And limit our defensiveness. And when I speak of forgiveness, we have to forgive ourselves and we also have to forgive others. Accept our limitations. Some people are not good singers and they want to lead a song in the choir. I've seen it throughout my life, but that's really not their gift. But they want to get up there and they'll get very angry and they'll say, well, the pastor is against me and, you know, the congregation, but it's really not their gift. So we have to know our limitations. Some people cannot cook. And they'll say, come on over, I baked this pie for you. And you're trying to think how you're going to get out of it because you know what's coming. And we have to know our limitations. And let go of, I should have done this, I should have done that. Because shoulds only lead again to the what ifs. And it kind of makes us bitter and it gets us out of alignment as well. Developing compassion, compassion for yourself, not being hard on yourself, knowing that it's okay to make a mistake. People make mistakes all the time. And choosing kindness over being right. Again, which is pretty hard. Uh, we love to be right. Uh, and resist the need to be critical. I guess you say that's something coming from a therapist because when we evaluate people, we pretty much write down everything 
if they're depressed or whatever is going on. But when I'm speaking of critical, I'm speaking of so critical that you start treating people differently and you start telling everybody else about uh, whatever uh, fault you see that they have. And this is a huge one here. Allow yourself mental health breaks. Now, I know that there's a lot of stigma on mental health, but mental health is needed. And we really have to kind of break down the barriers of even receiving mental health care, because oftentimes we will not receive mental health care until it gets so severe and we're already in, in a hospital situation, a psychiatric hospital situation. Now, I realize it has a lot of uh, stigma on it, but take mental health breaks regularly. And if you need mental health care, please seek care. And if you don't want to go by yourself, have a family member or, or someone who knows the system go with you to get the care that you need. So emotional resilience, being able to adapt to change, being able to fall down, but to get back up, being thinking that you're less than, but getting on a pathway of knowing that you, you are enough and you're good enough. So taking care of your mind, which is very important. I kind of just talked about that. Taking care of your body and, and also your spirit. It's, it, uh, spirit is so important. Eating well, that's another tough one. I mean, you can just drive in and get a little dollar burger as opposed to cooking in a hot kitchen, but the goal is to eat well. Also exercising, you know, nourish, uh, nourishing your body temple you know, getting up and walking, you don't have to be on the elliptical and all of that, but, you know, maybe taking a daily walk. And it, it doesn't have to be for five, 10 miles, maybe just around the block, something like that. And another essential thing is uh, getting enough sleep. Oftentimes when we're depressed or we have a lot of anxiety or a lot of things are going on, it can Im impact our sleep. So the goal is to get enough sleep because if we're not sleeping right, it can also lead to problems as well. And it's okay to pamper yourself, meaning it's okay to ramp up the self-care. Like during times like this when there's so much bad things on the news, not a whole lot of good things, and we're hearing about it, we need to ramp up the self-care of ourselves. Look ourselves in the eyes and say, I love you. You know, uh, you, you are enough. And to affirm, Affirm, uh, affirm that to yourself in affirmation. So pampering yourself. And of course, the prioritizing, setting limits, you can't do it all. Uh, making sure, uh, this is a, a wild one because they don't isolate yourself, but basically we have phys physical distancing, but what it means is reach out to someone like on Facebook or call someone on the phone. You can even write a letter and mail it and send it to them. I know we're away from writing letters and things like that. And don't get so self-absorbed in yourself or your situation that you can't get the care that you need or your spirit starts to get more and more crushed. Seek to understand. Really, sometimes when you're dealing with situation, try to look for the bigger meaning, the collective meaning on what is happening. And look for the humor in things. Now, don't make fun of people. I'm not saying that. But sometimes things are pretty, they can be humorous. And learn to live in the present moment. If you have enough money to pay your bill today, you're doing all right. Don't project back when you, you know, when you didn't have money. Don't worry about the future, but today you're okay. And you can limit a lot of stress that way. If you can just stay focused today and say, well, I, at least I have $20, my bills are paid. But when you start thinking about, what if I get a bill in the mail? What if I can't afford it? Again, we're back into that whole spiral of the what ifs. So living in the present moment, it's hard to do as well. A lot of this is hard to do. That's why we have to consistently have a, a strategy for ourselves. And don't ruminate on events that can't be changed. If it's something that's happened, release it. And it's hard to release, I know, but try to move forward, but live in the present moment how things are going right now. So some of, uh, when we look at life and balance and harmony and alignment, uh, 
we have to have a, 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 an alignment of mind, body, spirit, and soul. And I also say community, a community that supports you, a, a community that accepts you. So we have to have a sense of belonging. And uh, oftentimes the faith community provides that sense of belonging. Also respect. Everyone wants to be respected or feel respected and accepted and and feel important and included and secure all wrapped up in love and and those are critical for emotional health as well so we have to identify a spiritual path of wellness and recovery i know we may be going to the doctor and getting our pills for physical health and we still we still feel like there's a void and something isn't right i would say get on a spiritual path set some spiritual goals for yourself now, it doesn't mean you're going to set a goal, I'm going to sing a song in the choir today, or I'm, that may be a part of it, but spiritually, go into your core, and how are you going to keep your life force strong so that you can help others and you can help yourself? So how to align your spirit? Many people have different ways of aligning their spirit. Uh, more than likely, prayer. Uh, Reading the Bible may be a way that you align your spirit. Listening to a spiritual song. Uh, there are many ways to align your spirit. Uh, some do meditation or, or, or get, it, get in a quiet, still place to just kind of evaluate what's going on in their lives. Uh, affirmations. Some people have a daily affirmations. You know, some people uh, have affirmations. I go, today will be a victorious day or... I'm so happy and grateful uh, things are well as they are. Um, I am enough. Also, the uh, making I am statements. I am is very powerful because I am is God. And so whatever you connect with I am, you have to be careful. It just might manifest. So, you know, I am good enough. I am faithful. I am so happy and grateful that I have family that loves and supports me. So. Finding out what are those things that help you feel better and align your spirit. So we have to learn to adapt. Uh, there are so many things that are going to happen. They can become unpredictable. Like probably if we were to survey individuals in the United States, they would not believe that something called the coronavirus or COVID would be consuming our lives. So when things like that come, how are you going to adapt? How are you going to adapt to the change? Uh, here's another quote. Intelligence without ambition is a bird without wings. So we have to adapt. Some of the ways that we're adapting currently, we're wearing, all, we're wearing masks. Uh, we're using so much hand sanitizer. We're washing our hands and we're washing them again. We're washing them repeatedly. We're staying away from people. Uh, the six, uh, six foot rule. And so all of those are adaptations so that we can protect ourselves so that um, we can be okay. So adaptability, uh, again, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, but the ones who can adapt to change and who can really help themselves. Another part of this is surrender, the power of surrender. Some things we just have to cast on the Christ within and go free. Because if not, then we go back to the what ifs. We go back to I'm not enough. I'm missing the mark. I should have done this. I should have done this. They don't like me because they're treating me this way. So we have to surrender. Surrender is another gift. Forgiveness is a gift. Surrender is a gift. Living in the present moment is a gift if you can. And all of these things are cultivated through having daily spiritual practices to help the spirit being, which is, that's what we, that's who we are. So again, sometimes we have to hit the pause button. And surrender, in order to surrender, you have to be aware that there's something you need to surrender. I have to say that as well. So we have to keep our focus, be diligent, and also remove the doubts. We have to overcome the doubts and just trust, trust God uh, and surrender that he'll work it out. Like they have this gospel song, my five-year-old niece sings. She say, won't he do it? You know, the people will wonder how you 
how you sleeping at night? Won't he do it? So we have, when we surrender, we can have that testimony. So when we surrender, it's not a weak thing. Uh, we start to expand um, the more we surrender. And the more, and living from a hard space, there are gonna be so many experiences and so many things that's gonna come towards us. But if we live from the heart space and do no harm and practice forgiveness and practice love and wanna see people do well and, and be joyful, so we want to live from this alertness of that stems from coming from a place of love. And we know that love is the greatest of all, that a person can pass away, but the love is still here. And so love is very powerful and also forgiveness. Faith, the soul's belief in the divine's existence, its wisdom, its power, its love, and its grace. Faith is total confidence and respect for all people, all things. Even faith in your spiritual teachers. Sometimes we can go to a spiritual community and we hate the leaders in the, up there because we feel we know better. But have faith in our spiritual teachers. I think that they are appointed of God because they go through a lot. They have a lot to deal with. When you are responsible for the soul of a person, that's a whole lot because we know a lot of the issues flow out of the soul or, or being of the soul or the spirit being out of alignment. So having faith in our spiritual teachers. Now we know everybody, you know, no one is perfect and no one is in perfection, but, and also the teachings as well. And have faith in yourself that you can do better. Patience, that's another one. I'm supposed to be working on patience for the, I think it was for the year 2019. I don't know how I did with it. I probably didn't do very well because I, boy, I get, ex, I get revved up, but faith and patience complement each other. You know, without faith, you can't, you know, it's impossible to please God as we know, you know, and faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. We want to see everything. Um, and patience allows things to unfold naturally. Right. Most of the time we're rushing things. Even when we're cooking a meal, we're like, that, that should be ready already. And so patience is believing that whatever you need will come your way at the perfect time. Again, living in the present moment, uh, realizing that if you do get out of alignment, you can get right back on the road of alignment uh, as well. So how do we step into this new beginning? Because you're probably saying, this lady is talking about all this stuff, you know, like she knows or whatever. But I would say when you get on the spiritual path and, and you're truly honest and authentic about the spiritual path, new mercies come each day. You can see them already. Like if you woke up this morning and you didn't have the COVID-19, you're okay. Even if you had it and you were doing well, that's a mercy. So grace and mercy, new mercies each day, stepping into a new beginning. You know, the number eight signifies a new beginning. And so we all can start right where we are here today and choose to have a new beginning. It doesn't matter what has happened in your life because again, things are gonna happen. We are gonna have experiences, some that we like and some that we don't like. Uh, uh, as you know, I'm a licensed therapist, and the name of my practice is Alabaster Moments. And the reason I name my practice Alabaster Moments is because there was a woman in the Bible who she was seen as probably less than, but she had this alabaster box, and it was filled with this precious, precious oil, and she gave all that she had. And by giving all that she had, people are talking about her even today. It's been millions of years, and people are still talking about that alabaster box and how this woman gave all she had, but they were looking down on this woman as not good enough, less than, missing the mark. She should be doing this. She should be doing that. But that one encounter has been talked about by so many people. And so new mercies each day can lead to the new beginning that you, you desire. And so 
Again, speaking power words. Uh, if you're speaking, you might as well speak something that's going to make you feel better and something that's going to anchor you and something that you can go back to when, when, when it does get a little rocky and bumpy. And so some of those words might be peace. It might be family. It might be energy. It might be integrity. It might be love. It might be create. Whatever your words are, and words are creators, by the way. And so, but having those power words, speak power. Uh, you know, speak into life. You know, the Bible says you can decree a thing and it'll happen. So those words, and matter of fact, the whole universe was spoken into existence. So learn about speaking those powerful words for yourself. Uh, don't, and, and, and remember to hold on to faith, walking by faith, not by sight. So I don't care how grim the situation is, you start declaring and you start decreeing and you start speaking it. Uh, when I was living in Oakland, all the youth would say, speak on it. So if you're speaking on it, speak with power. Speak those good words. Speak those words that are going to bring life. Speak words that align you at your core from the inside out. Also, attend to your relationships. Uh, try to connect with the group. Be powerful. Uh, don't worry about your circumstances, but speak those words of power and uh, achieve things in life. It may be just knitting a blanket or whatever, but find time to achieve something. Live a life of pleasure and satisfaction. You may be at the fork in the road. <laughs> you may not know where you're going to get your next meal or whatever, but choose to do something that's pleasurable if you can. Uh, keep life full of exciting events and behave respectfully. Sometimes we can kind of go off the chart with our behavior. So we want to behave respectfully. And sometimes when we're wounded at our core, we may not behave respectfully. Uh, follow a life path. Uh, be a spiritual person. Set spiritual goals along with your other goals. Be secure. Recognize that we live in a world that good things are happening, even though there may be trouble all around, if we see it that way with our perception. Contribute to the larger community. Uh, there's a, a Caribbean, Caribbean proverb that said, many hands make light work. So if everybody is given what they have, we can work together and contribute to our community. Uh, Develop a personal philosophy for life. So if someone asks you, what is, what is your philosophy for life? Let them know how, you know, what drives your motivation and how you treat people and have integrity. You know, what would you do if nobody is watching? Have integrity. Be secure. And if you, if you have had a lot of experiences in your life that are beating you down, where you feel weak, where you feel like you can't go on, just picture that you have a blank canvas and you can start right here today and start over and start reshaping your life. That it's never too late to reshape your life. There have been so many people that have turned around. And enjoy, enjoy life. Set a vision for yourself. It says in the Bible, I think it's the book of Habakkuk, it says write the vision and make it plain. Um, and so, uh, basically have a mental picture of what you, what, you, what you want your life to be. Life is a gift. And the vision comes from within inside of us. It holds our hopes, it holds our ideas, and it holds our dreams. And walk through life with a sense of purpose. Again, write your vision and make it plain. Grow. Choose growth. Um, and have a sense of purpose. And affirm, I have faith that all is well. No matter what's going, going on, no matter what kind of feelings start to generate, know that you can begin again. There are new mercies each morning. And you can affirm, I have faith that all is well. And so now we'll open it up for reflections or questions. Yes. Um, first of all, wow. Uh, uh, Sharon, this has been awesome. This has been a lot of very insightful 
yet practical information. And um, uh, I want to let people know just to, to settle their, their minds that uh, we will make the PowerPoint available so that individuals can go back because some of the things that you were sharing, it is definitely, I, I mean, I think one thing on the slide could be uh, something to reflect on and meditate on, uh, you know, just in a day or in a moment. So uh, this has been such a blessing. And to the Breakers family, uh, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, those that were able to join, we do have Facebook Live going as well. Our goal now is to open up and allow for you all to come uh, off of mute <laughs> and be able to actually engage uh, Sharon and uh, ask some questions. And um, uh, she's prepared to provide uh, feedback based on her uh, professional experience. And um, I, I know I had a question uh, from Pastor Kwame and uh, Sharon, his question was related to, uh, as you spoke of the uh, developmental ages for, you know, between the age of newborn to three years old and mm -hmm. how it plays a huge role in, in our uh, overall uh, perception. And the question is basically, what, what do you do when something happens between that time frame, uh, say a trauma or a tragedy or something like that? What is the advice or hope for individuals who uh, maybe have had things happen in their lives to, to, to infringe upon how they see uh, things presently? Uh, yes, I can answer that. The World Health Organization says that the earlier that a person gets treatment or gets assistance, the outcomes will be more positive. So there are gonna always be situations that happen, but the earlier you get a person into care or you, you get them into interventions, then uh, the outcomes can increase and get better and more positive. So uh, oftentimes what happens is individuals don't get the help until later, later in life. And, um, uh-oh. Are we, okay? we did that intentionally. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I people can like, just look at you now. Okay. okay, I saw all these people. I'm like, what, what went down? Okay. So, so basically, feeling okay to get help as soon as it happens. Now, there are some situations when, you know, depending on the situation, but the earlier you can get some help, and not only just getting the help, but also incorporating those strategies into the family so that the whole family can work on getting better. Uh, there may be one encounter or one, one adverse event that happens, but bringing the family together uh, in, a, in an early intervention type of way to get the treatment and to get the help. And oftentimes that's the best path to take, but oftentimes people wait late for various reasons. And, and again, there is such a stigma with mental health care where uh, as in the African-American community, we even with physical health, we're almost at the verge of checking out before we go in. Not all people, but for the most part, because uh, that's another whole training, you know, the fear of medicine and, and uh, racism in medicine and the Tuskegee incident and all of that. So, but uh, the short answer to his question is the earlier you get in to get help, uh, the better your chances are. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, listen, um, you know, you all have the ability to unmute yourself, I would love for Sharon to be able to have a person to person interaction with the, uh, who I believe to be one of the most phenomenal groups of people on the face of the earth. And so if you have comments or if you have feedback or questions, please feel free to chime in at this time. I'm user friendly, you can ask me a question. <laughs> I don't know it all, if not, I'll put it in the parking lot and look it up. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, Apostle Sandra. Hi, um, thank you so much. This was just a very powerful presentation. Um, and following up on, on Apostle Aramis's comments, I look forward to receiving the PowerPoint because yes. although I was taking notes, um, so many of those slides and the um, the information, the points that were made are just a pause point they're like a say la, you know, pause and calmly think about that. And yes. so uh, look forward to reflecting on that, on that some more. I have no question, but I just really appreciate um, this, 
this very, very wonderful information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Apostle Sandra. Um, I'm scrolling through the list of people who are actually on the call. And okay. um, I, I want, if, if I don't get enough uh, volunteers, I'm going <laughs> oh, to go to individuals. You're going to go to calling on them? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, listen, Evangelist Michelle looks like she's ready to say something. OK. <laughs> oh, man. No, I just want to say I, I appreciate it. Um, you setting this up uh, for us. This was very timely. I would say for me, some, I was actually having some of the things that we discussed the conversation um, over these last few days and even just recognizing, you know, within myself, some of the things that um, are going well, but also some things that still need to be yes. addressed. So yes. yeah, I was like, well, I didn't really know what to expect, um, you know, coming in, but this was awesome. And so one question I would ask, um, my family and I, my husband and I are separated, mm -hmm. most likely looking for divorce, yes. headed towards divorce, and just kind of wanting to um, know maybe some things I should watch, like maybe for my children. So far, we, we seem to be doing, you know, okay with mm -hmm. the transition, but just mm -hmm. not going, having gone through this before, what would I like need to be aware of that you well, would say? For Yes, first of all, any any noted change in behavior for your children, like if they're not eating their favorite food or something like that, or they're isolating, not playing their little games, or not wanting to do this, uh, any noted behavior like that, uh, things like that. Uh, also, more of the nonverbal, too, like uh, if they're kind of low in energy or, uh, you know, getting more tearful or sad, you know, sad real quickly and things like that. And also anger. If you notice that they have a short fuse, things like that, you want to pay close attention to that as well. And, and another thing about separations and divorce, uh, that's where forgiveness really comes in and, and um, mm -hmm. kind of reestablishing your, your sense of purpose and also making sure no matter what happens, you still uphold the dignity of their father, even though it may have not worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, you still in front of your children or you be authentic and just still uphold the dignity and the and the, the strong parts of, of that individual, even though you may not be going to be together, and you still work to uh, strengthen uh, your children so that they stay on the uh, pathway of alignment, and you're you're readily there for them. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, great question, Avengers uh, Mashera. Um, anyone else? I think we've got the engine uh, turning. Okay. Uh, the fire, I see your hand. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm driving. Um, my question is, can and I guess I have a daughter, so I'm I. Can it be hereditary? I guess I noticed like some of my um, some of the anxiety that I still kind of deal with as an adult and that I dealt with as a child, I noticed like she has some of that same anxiety, especially like when it comes to being around like a lot of people or, yes. uh, you know, older men or whatever the case may be. Like, can it be hereditary or is it learned or how does that work? Uh, there, are, uh, there are quite a number of views on it. Uh, environment, um, we all have genes and cells, and uh, sometimes certain behaviors uh, can activate the, the cell or the gene. Uh, it can be passed down generationally, and sometimes it skips generations, but there are many factors. But the thing about mental illness is that it's a brain disease. Just like your pancreas, when it gets unwell, you have diabetes. When your mind becomes, un when your brain gets unwell, uh, you can develop a, a mental health concern. For example, there's a in the brain there's acetylcholine, which is the brake pedal of the brain, and so when that is not working properly, when you can't put a brake, your thoughts may just be racing and going back and forth. If there is not enough norepinephrine and dopamine in the brain, that means that it's like a short-circuited fuse, and you can either start to feel depressed and have the lows, or you can start skyrocketing with the increased energy. And so again, mental illness is about a brain disease. Uh, and, uh, and since your brain is not, uh, the neurotransmitters are not 
firing and, and transferring the chemicals the way that they should, then that's when you can have the more, more energy and the anxiety. Or you can even go into the thoughts that are not true, uh, you know, loss of contact with reality. It doesn't mean that you're not an educated or intellectual person, but basically it's a brain disease and the chemicals are not firing right. And so it's manifesting as depression, anxiety, and also environment plays a huge role as well. Uh, like for veterans, when they get in high impact situations, it, act, it could activate, you know, uh, mental health concerns as well. So fire uh, another, it. Oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Gonna, I was just going to add one. Of, another thing is, is that, uh, it's been passed down generationally. We also want to look at environments and, uh, you know, the type of environment uh, that we have, uh, the, the, you know, if abuse or, or things like that, the adverse childhood issues uh, that can come forth. And so we want to take a look at that because, you know, sometimes individuals grew up in domestic violence and then uh, the daughter grows up and she's in domestic violence and so forth. And, and, and it's generationally. So you want to break those uh, generational things like that so that health and wellness can go forward. And to know that it's okay to get help when you need it uh, for any, whether it's a physical illness or mental illness, whatever the, the, uh, the illness, you know, it's okay to seek help. Sapphire, was that um, a good answer for you? Have anything else you want to add to it? She was driving. She must have hit she a road. She was driving, car. yes. Yeah. <laughs> she <laughs> must have be mindful. <laughs> Her we'll signal mindful. must have went out. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I do believe that that was. That was great. Thank you. Okay, she's back. She was back on. Excellent, excellent. Uh, th thank you so much. That was definitely a very insightful uh, response. Anyone else want to share? Um, or anyone else have any questions? I think it's Mashira. Mashira? Oh, Mashira, I'm sorry. Is it Mashira? Am I? Yeah. Okay, you can go. Hi, Mashira, go ahead. Um. This was everything because, yeah, this, I like, I like this. Um, it was everything. I wrote down basically almost everything you said for, for real. <laughs> um, the one part where you were talking about uh, being critical of ourselves, like being more forgiving, because I, a lot of times I find myself when stuff go wrong, I always blame myself. And I see that my daughter do the same thing. Mm -hmm. She blames herself. And I, and it's like, I was trying to tell her, don't do that. It's like, okay, I'm being hypocritical because I do the same thing. So how, how, how do, how do you break from that? Like how, how do you break from that? Like. Well, you're already on track with it uh, because you have awareness. In order to address anything, you have to become aware. And so uh, becoming aware and then putting different strategies in place to help, to help yourself. Uh, uh, you kind of spoke to uh, internalized oppression. Like if I tell my daughter, you'll never be good enough, or uh, then she'll grow up and start telling her kids, she'll never be good enough. And so oftentimes we say, we'll never be like our mother or father. And then we wake up and we're just like them. And so watch the messages and watch the behavior that we have in front of our children. And once we get on a, a positive path, not to say that you're not, a positive path and of this awareness, I think that that's how we get better. By going to the core, looking at ourselves, becoming aware, and not just become aware, but moving it into the action phase. And so you can start right here today and start working on yourself. And it takes con continuous working, you know, continuous self-care, continuous uh, working on yourself. And so that's what it is, a set a plan for yourself, a spiritual plan. And teach your daughter that spiritual plan. Yes. Uh, there's an African proverb that says the destruction of the family starts from within the home. So we have to really be careful, you know, with the messages that we give verbal, nonverbal, and our behavior. 
And so you, you seem to be very aware, Mashari, it's such fancy names up here, Mashira. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm gonna send pastors some, um, some tools and there's one book I would like for you to have, Raising the Emotionally Healthy Child. And it, it, it covers those five areas to feel included, important, respected, secure, and to be accepted. And so I'm gonna, I have his box on the floor in there and I'm gonna be sending it off to him soon. So I'll put, put some of those books in the box for people who wanna take a look. It's an easy read. It's not like a dissertation or anything. It's a little tiny book. Yeah. That would be excellent. Mm -hmm. That would be excellent. Uh, thank you so much. And Mashira, that was a great question. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I know it resonated uh, with everybody um, that has children and cares very much about making sure that they're putting the children in the best position to succeed. Uh, we yes. have a, another hand from the Francis family. Um, okay. You can go ahead and share. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Um, just a quick question as far as uh, trauma. You mentioned trauma earlier. Um, yes, yes. Trauma. And mm -hmm. so as one who has dealt with a lot of trauma in relationships, just mm -hmm. asking if there was any like tools or advice that you have as far as moving forward in creating healthy relationships or having healthy relationships without that fear of repeated trauma. Yes, I do. Uh, the first thing is to learn what a healthy relationship is. And also to get, uh, cause oftentimes when I work with clients, they often don't know what a healthy relationship is. What they've, they've carried the messages from previous generations. They've saw how mom did it and how dad did it. And they're thinking that that's how the relationship is supposed to be. So first of all, seeing what healthiness is. Second of all, loving yourself to the maximum more than the other person. And uh, there's something called codependency where you're given, you're just given of yourself to this other person and you've poured your whole life into this other person. And so reverse it and pour that self-care and that love into yourself so that you can attract the mate that's with the same vibration that you have. If you have a vibration of I'm not good enough, more than likely you will align with some person that makes that come true. So basically loving yourself, wrapping up the self-care, telling yourself you're good enough and really believing it and, and walking from that. Let that be your truth and walk from it. And just don't, and another thing, don't just settle for anybody. You know, really have your list of what you want in a mate and make sure that it's something healthy, not just good looks and, you know, long eyelashes and all that, but, you know, somebody that's going to really be true to you, someone that's going to respect you, someone that's going to make you feel secure, and definitely someone that's not going to put their hands on you and try to cause you harm. And so loving yourself. Yes, um, I th for clarity's sake, uh, she mm -hmm. is married. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, but I wanted to make sure, but I do believe that everything that you share, it's still, okay. it, it's yes, still for the most part. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, her husband is actually mm -hmm. one of the finest men I ever met. So from okay. that perspective, she's yes. good. But I, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to say that what you share, it applies mm -hmm. across, you know, yes. relationships, you know, okay. beyond the mate into just person to person relationships, mm -hmm. what you share yeah. still apply. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, Nikisha, yeah. was that insightful for you? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And yes, it still applies. I understood. Yes. Even beyond that. I'm not saying yeah. you're getting beat up, Nikisha, but I'm just telling you, self-love <laughs> can open many doors, you know, and oftentimes <laughs> in the Baptist church, you know, I'm from Louisiana, they say, oh, you're unevenly yoked. And so there's some truth in all, and, and a lot of the things that our forefathers were telling us. And so you have to get somebody that's on the same alignment that you're on. And so, yeah, that's true. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, what time is it? Okay, we have a, a, about 15 more minutes, I think, that we slated. Um, I want to inject the question here, Sharon. And this question is in relationship to uh, trust as it relates to uh, getting ther uh, therapy or getting counseling, because yes, yes. you know, I know me personally, and I know many others, uh, the challenge isn't so much 
do I want to talk to someone? It's mm -hmm. finding the right person. Um, yes. and, and being a person of faith is, is as if in many cases you, you can often end up with a counselor that may not be a believer at all. And mm -hmm. so how they perceive even your faith uh, is seen differently and it can impact how the counseling goes. So yes. for those who are looking for um, excellent counseling, while at the same time ensuring that their faith and, mm -hmm. and their, their belief in God is, is not attacked in any way, uh, what kind of advice would you give? Well, first of all, there are therapists that, um, you know, that are faith-based, but, you know, there are also different levels of faith-based. But I would say uh, having that honest talk with them and, and letting them know what the expectations are, letting them know, uh, letting the therapist know, you know, what you're looking for. And usually when you're seeking a therapist, there's like a little initial screening. And in that initial screening, you let the therapist know, that person know, you know, I'm looking for someone who, you know, believes in faith principles or believes in God and, uh, and believes in utilizing spirituality as a resource. Uh, because there may be some, because for years, you know, the whole mixing of church and state and you couldn't use anything spiritual. But here in the state of California, we had a survey that went out a few years ago, and most of the people that were seeking services put spirituality as the top resource. Also, prayer and being able to uh, seek guidance from someone greater than themselves. So, uh, I would say, uh, in that initial screening, let them know, you know, what you were looking for. Just like when a person calls and says, "I'm looking for someone who can do cognitive behavioral therapy," you would say, "I'm looking for someone." who's a spiritual belief, believer, and uh, I'm a Christian, and, and who believes in uh, Christian principles and, and Christ consciousness, and so you would, you would want to just be up front. That's a little scary, because, you know, a lot of these systems are hard to navigate, but just be very, uh, you know, put it out there, and make your little list. This is what I want in a therapist, because just like in all professions, some are good, some are mediocre, and some are outstanding. And so you want to really think it out and navigate the system and, and also look at the reviews. Oftentimes, therapists have a little profile on psychology.com or whatever, and you want to see what people are saying about them. If 10 people said, oh, my God, I'll never go back to them again, that might be a red flag. But I would say start with your list of what you want in a therapist and move from there. And if you you know, if you're courageous enough to call up and get a screening, just let them go from your list, bullet one, bullet two on through. And to know that it's okay to get uh, uh, help from a therapist, it's all health care. For years, they've separated the neck from the body, but really, we're going to have to connect it back because the spirit is in the body and there's no way the mind can work if the spirit is not connected to it. Well, yeah. all right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Hey. Hey Amen. That was an excellent answer uh, because I, I know that, you know, just knowing that going into it, you can go into counseling from a place of strength and, mm -hmm. and not necessarily from a place of complete yeah. uh, desperation or yes. uh, because that, that desperation often causes you to settle for, for, for anything. And yes. to know that it's okay uh, if you have the strength and the, and the fortitude to lay out the things that are important to you that those yeah. things should be presented and those things should be researched out from the beginning. I think that's amazing. Uh, yeah. It looks like we have someone from the Francis home again. Okay. Uh, and so uh, go ahead, you're on the air. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for taking my call. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> this, this is Kwame Sharon. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's really insightful and very timely and very, very helpful. Um, one of the things that I would say is um, just navigating mental health. First of all, you mentioned the, the stigma, but mm -hmm. it seems like it's very difficult to find. It's, it's almost like it's an underserved area. Like there's a yes. lot of um, gaps in terms of finding a good therapist or psychiatrist or what have you. Mm -hmm. So for people who, first of all, you, you work up the courage to, to reach out to to, for mm -hmm. mental health, and then you run into these uh, roadblocks from somebody who's, you know, put themselves out there to, to seek it, mm -hmm. and then 
you know, and, and even in the, in the COVID era, it's, you know, there's a lot of backlog and people are not taking new, new patients. Um, yes. Any advice, whether, whether it is to um, seek online or virtual visits, so what have you, any advice you would have for that individual? Well, uh, we want the treatment, but have roadblocks. Here, here in the state of California, the State Department of Healthcare Services uh, allow for uh, telemental health. They also are even approving telephone therapy now because uh, to to reach to those outlying areas and communities, and also in in many communities, transportation is a barrier, is a huge barrier, and so uh, just coming up with strategic ways. Also, uh, lots of time the faith community is like a first responders where people go and have an individuals who can be like uh, peer support in the faith community uh, to help people as well. Now we know that there are different levels of, you know, that people might need, but building a community of um, peer support and, and helping individuals. Uh, but help, and in some communities they have health navigators because, you know, it can be a, a kind of like a bureaucracy and um, not knowing what type of insurance. Sometimes people go all the way and they make it and then they say, well, we're not taking your insurance. But again, uh, having someone to help you research Anyone? on the front end, and that way you won't get to the roadblock because if you know right. that if you go through all of that, that you're not gonna get um, the care that you need, then what you would do is maybe uh, select another option. And I, I also no, recommend- like the suicide prevention hotline or uh, yeah, uh, national alliance on mental illness often has a lot of peer support and help throughout the united states so if you can't reach a therapist you can always re reach um, some of the hotlines that they have set up for uh, with peer support and to help uh, to help uh, help you get information and so again uh, to be, kind of build the toolkit and to build a resource list uh, for people to know who to call during this time. So if you can't get into a therapist, um, the research shows that if you can just talk to a person, if you're feeling real bad or whatever, uh, if it's the right person, then your mood will lift until you can get the therapist. So uh, additional uh, things in your toolkit, such as the different hotlines um, where you can call and a person can kind of talk to you and hear you out. They even have a lot of spiritual uh, hotlines that you can call as, as well. I don't know if you have one at the church, but if you had volunteers, you could set up a, a hotline uh, where uh, volunteers can volunteer and, and receive calls from individuals. And so the church is a community within itself. And there are many strengths within the body of uh, the church. And so pulling together uh, the village approach and helping individuals. And I know the confidentiality and all of that, but on a basic level, setting up uh, avenues for people can, you know, get information such as this. Yeah. All right, excellent. Helpful, uh, Pastor Kwame? Yes, that was very helpful. And uh, we got to work on setting up that list of resources. I added yes. that to a list of to do. So yes, that is very helpful. Yes, because um, you got a lot of strong people there and so, there are so many gifts in the church, people who are just so brilliant, you know, that have the gift, to, you know, to uh, talk to people and they feel better and, and, and the gift of encouragement. And so just building on those strengths, but a resource list is good because individuals want something in hand that they can call right away and get a live person. So they can't get a therapist. They can always call uh, these different hotlines uh, in the area. Yes, and and that is definitely like Pastor Kwame said, very good information. Um, I want to uh, introduce Pastor Kwame. He is actually um, the assistant pastor of the church, and oh, okay. uh, yes, and that's Nikisha's uh, husband, and oh, okay. also uh, he is a, a physician. Uh, has, oh my goodness! Works with, yep, he works uh, with, as a family physician. But mm -hmm. he's also uh, the pastor over health and wellness for the church. So he and Wonderful. I have been working diligently together uh, to provide experiences like this. And mm -hmm. really, we're we're building this into the fabric of what we do as a ministry because yes. it's it's known that for so long, especially in the black church, that mm -hmm. counseling on this level was often frowned upon. And uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, and most of them were not actually good reasons. So um, yeah. to, to know that we can actually 
you know, turn the ship towards uh, health from the inside out, as you were sharing, mm -hmm. uh, yes. is very powerful. I also mm -hmm. received a statement from uh, one of the members that said that it's don't wait until you're you're uh, in the middle of a drama before you seek help, because mm -hmm. you're a lot more teachable when things are not at the at the peak level. Like when yes. when drama peaks, it's a lot more difficult maybe mm -hmm. to be able to connect and reason. And so um, from prior experience, this individual is saying that from their therapist, they learn not to wait till things worsen, uh, mm -hmm. try to tackle it when you first sense um, some type of disturbance that way. So that was good advice as well. So mm -hmm. thanks for sharing. Yes, she's uh, referring to prevention and early intervention. Like if you uh, learn about diabetes early in life, hopefully you won't do all the things, you know, that lead into uh, increasing your risk factors. So yeah, prevention and early intervention is, is really nice. Excellent. So um, I don't see any more hands. We're getting close to the end of our time together. I'm actually kind of uh, saddened by that because I do believe that you have done a phenomenal job of mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, just preparing for this particular uh, undertaking mm -hmm. and also giving us um, a map to go off of and, and a lot of insight uh, yeah. to really shape in our, our view and our expectation, our optimism mm -hmm. uh, for the future. And so um, I don't know, uh, Sharon, if you have any last words or before uh, I prepare to transition off a last piece of advice, um, the hope is that we'll have you on again. Uh, yeah. But is there anything you'd like to share uh, just, before just, you? Just, just one thing, um, uh, a quote that I usually uh, use in, uh, whenever I'm presenting is by Dr. Albert uh, Schweitzer. And his quote, this is paraphrase, says that, you know, don't be shocked, um, you know, like when your spark goes out, that another human being may just uh, come about and ignite that spark again. So, uh, you know, I feel like we all have that capability to reignite uh, the spark of the human spirit and um, make sure that everyone is walking on one accord and in alignment. Yes, yes, well said. I actually looked at the uh, your bio and I didn't read it because I didn't have it up before my face, but yes. I believe it's the last statement. I'm gonna read it. Yes, um, read it. And, and it says this, at times our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lightened the flame with us, within us. And um, I, I so, in my life as a, a shepherd, 18 years, I, I can so resonate with that statement, uh, not only from the standpoint of the one that, that offers the support, but how often someone has ignited or reignited uh, my flame um, so that I can continue on uh, in what God has called for me to do. Just today, I received a very thoughtful note uh, from someone that's been watching from afar. And uh, they also wrote a check and gave an offering to the church and said, I know that things are difficult and I know you work in sometimes impossible situations, but I want you to know that you're appreciated, that you're loved, and um, that we're praying for you. And that was the highlight of my day. It, it, it was there to start my day. And wow. just like that, my flame was brightened all the more. And so it is definitely true that, as you said, if you are in between uh, that time of actually connecting with a license a professional certified therapist that get around people who uh, represent light and strength in your life, people who have a positive uh, attitude and, and, and a, a, that carry God's spirit and, and provide for safety and refuge uh, and counsel uh, so that you can get that added fuel to keep going. We all need it. And so, yes. um, and Sharon, uh, we all need people like you. Uh, so we thank you so much for being with us. We thank you You're for quite taking welcome. <laughs> of your time. This has been phenomenal. And I can't wait to hear feedback from the ministry beyond uh, the Zoom call. Uh, people okay. are clapping on the mute and they're lifting their hands. They're excited. They appreciate it. 
and mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we have to have you back really soon. Okay. Well, yeah, when the so, praises go up, the blessings come down. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, hallelujah. So I'm going to close out with a word of prayer, and then we'll finish. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, whether you join via Zoom, whether you join via uh, Facebook Live. We appreciate you joining in, and um, we, we're wishing for the best for everyone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do honor and thank you for this day. Truly, this is the day that you've made, and our souls, our spirits rejoice, and we're glad in it. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just your plan. You had this day in mind from the beginning of time for those, oh God, that would be here to, to listen. And we thank you, God, for the impact. We thank you for the encouragement. We thank you, Father God, for the insights that we've all received to meet us in our place of need so that we can have the fuel that is necessary to continue to go forth with, with strong uh, commitment, with resilience, and also the ability to adapt, not, not to allow uh, the circumstances and the challenges that come to all of us in life to get the best of us, but through your strength and through the guidance that you provide to be able to overcome every hardship and every difficult situation and experience the life that you promised to all those who love you and keep your commitments. Our prayer is that you would lift us all, that you would nourish us all, that you would build us all in the area of our emotions, in the area of our innermost being, that we can be honest within ourselves and also open to those that God, you are prepared to be strength and guidance to help us to become our best version of ourselves. We pray a special blessing over Sharon and all the work that she does, every person that she touches with her professionalism, with her insight and with her spirit. We pray God that for every person who, who gives of their, their all, that, that alabaster spirit, that Lord, that you would use her to lift such ones who are marginalized, disenfranchised, and altogether overlooked, that they too can rise from the hardships and the darkness of their experiences and experience the benefits that you bring. And we thank you for your love and your power to accomplish what we pray in faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank brave you for friends, having me. That listen. And uh, we will be in touch. Have a wonderful, blessed rest of the night. And bye-bye. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.